read from Mark chapter 10 and just three verses, Janice. I only need to go to verse 34. I said 35, but it's actually <clears throat> to verse 34. Mark 10, verse 32 to 34. Reading from the NIV. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, will hand him over, hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. 8.29, 10.45. That's the two key verses in Mark's Gospel. We're getting nearer and nearer to 10.45. That will come next week. But here is the Lord Jesus for the third time telling them in Mark's Gospel what's going to happen to him. Now, if you turn back just a page or two and find chapter 8 and verse 31, you'll see that this is the third time Jesus has told them what's going to happen. There's a verse in the Psalms which says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Now, I read that verse and I think, if we will live close to the Lord, he will give us insights, warnings and helps about what will happen to us and to the fellowship of the Lord's people. So stay close to him and you'll hear his voice directing you. So in 8.31 it says this, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and after three days, rise again. It's very interesting, the reaction of Peter to that. Now, Peter's a spokesman, usually, for all the disciples. Notice his reaction in verse 32. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And that's later on, where Peter realises he's the Messiah. Now, look at chapter 9 and verse 31. So it's 8.31, 9.31. This is the Lord Jesus explaining to them again about what's going to happen. Give it context, I'll read from verse 30. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But then you read verse 32. They didn't understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. In our lives, you know, God gives us revelation. He explains to us truth. He doesn't give it all to you in one go. You couldn't possibly handle it, nor could I. And so there are clearly stages in our life where God explains in more depth and more power and more authority the very things he wants us to know. So that's why you need to live a relationship with the Lord Jesus every day. Because every day has something fresh and wonderful to tell you but it's your responsibility to live your life listening to him, just as it's mine listening to him as well. Now, theologians talk about righteousness in two ways. Last week you heard Eddie speak about a man who constructed his own righteousness. I'm good, I've kept all these commandments, but there's one thing you lack, said Jesus, seeing right into his heart, give away all that you possess and then follow me. You cannot construct your own righteousness, my dear friend. We've said this so many times here, but I think one final time I'll say it today. If you think that you can get yourself into the presence of God by your own goodness or go to heaven because you're a good person, 
you are listening to the enemy's lie. Now you see, what really is true is that you need a righteousness freely given to you from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's called imputed righteousness. Theologically, that's the term they use. That means Jesus has won it for you and gives it to you totally and completely when you believe on him. So if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, God looks at you and declares you righteous. Of course, he expects you to live a life that lives up to that, but it's a declaration. My own personal view is God will never change his mind about you if you have truly trusted in him. That's your righteousness for the rest of your life. When you stand before Jesus in the glory and he looks at you and you look at him, he will accept you out of his love, yes, but because you have on you a garment of righteousness freely given to you when you believed. So you are completely accepted by the Lord. That is a tremendous stable factor in every one of our lives. Our emotions will go up and down. Even our experience of God may go up and down. But what you trust in is what God says about you. I have accepted you in the beloved. You are a child of mine. I love you immensely and intensely. You are safe in Jesus' hands. Now, I don't know if you've ever met anyone who would say that they were born again or knew what it's like to be in a revival. A revival is when God spiritually awakens Christians first and then through the impact of their lives and their prayers saves thousands of people who do not know the Lord. Well, one revival was in East Africa, actually Rwanda. Most of us will remember Rwanda as a place where there was terrible battling and fighting a few years ago. Well, I wish I could remember his name. I've scratched my head over and over again this week if I could remember the name of the vicar who was minister at Gwythian, St. Gothian, the church in Gwythian. And this man experienced revival in East Africa. He knew what it was to see hundreds of people repenting and turning to the Lord suddenly because God had moved on their hearts. Wouldn't it be tremendous if today somebody in 4th Street, Madruf, fell on their knees and repented and believed in Jesus because the presence of God was so overwhelming they had to deal with God. Now that's what happens in revival. I've yet to live in days like that. I long for God to do it. But I know even in my prayers, it's God's, in God's hand to give it or not give it. But we as Christians should seek to live a life that makes it easier for God to bring revival than harder. And this is what he told me. The thing I remember about the East African revival, Andrew, is this. The preaching of the cross to Christians. The preaching of the cross to Christians, not just non-Christians. We're always offering Jesus Christ, and that's right. We have an evangelistic essence to almost every message that's ever preached in this church. But what about the cross and what it means to Christians, to you and to me? That's something that will come out in this talk here this morning because that's incredibly important. Because you as a Christian cannot live as if you don't need the cross anymore. We don't stay at the cross. We have the resurrection life of Jesus in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. But none of us can look at this table and say, it doesn't matter to me anymore. I've done it enough. Or to look at that behind me and say, oh, that's for non-Christians. That's not for me. You see, the preaching of the cross is just as much what I need and you need as a non-Christian needs. And I know that most of the people who are listening to this, all the most of the people that are here, already know the Lord, as far as I can tell. Right, the first thing that I notice in this passage is the place where he's going. Now, some of you have had the privilege and joy of actually going to Jerusalem. There is at least one person here who lived in Israel for quite a long time, off and on. So for them, Jerusalem is a place they recognise and have been to. But what does it mean for Jesus to go there? That's where the temple is. That's where the sacrifices are carried out 
week on week on week on week since God had set the law down in the book of the Bible. It's the place where the Passover will be. But it's the place where the opposition is. It's the place where the opposition is. And you see, the Lord Jesus Christ sets his face like a flint to go there. To go to the place where he will be arrested and murdered and executed and then rise again. So he sets his face like a flint. And there's a wonderful reference, if you would like to look at it in your own Bible, it's Isaiah 50, verses 6 to 7. Isaiah 50, 6 to 7. Do you realize, by the way, that one of the reasons you know the Bible is true and accurate is because there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies written years before anything actually happened, and then every single one of them is literally true and is carried out. That's why I believe in the literal second coming of the Lord Jesus, because every single prophecy about the second coming will come true, just as the ones about the first do. So as I read this in Isaiah 6 and 7, can you see Jesus in these verses? It's not difficult. Can you see him? Verse 6, Isaiah 50. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I find it hard when I have my beard cut, let alone pulled out. It must be incredibly painful. That's a little bit of the pain the Lord Jesus went through. There's far worse than that. I didn't hide my face from mocking and spitting. What a prophecy that is of what Jesus is going to go through. It then says, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. The determination of the Lord Jesus Christ to do exactly what his Father wants him to do is tremendous. Right, this is going to date me, but one or two of you might know this name. 1992, 100 metres, Barcelona Olympics, Linford Christie. Yeah, a few nods. Well, I checked out on YouTube what my memory said to me. This is how Linford Christie looked before he ran the race. He was absolutely and totally focused on the tape at the end. 100 metres. There was a full start by the American athlete next to him, but that didn't swing Linford. Linford Christie kept that incredible focus looking directly ahead all the time before the race began. About halfway down the lane, he took the lead and he held it to the end and he won the gold medal, which is quite rare for a British athlete to win 100 metres. It's usually an American or someone from the Caribbean. But he won. And because he was looking so directly. Now, I've tried to develop this stare myself occasionally, but I'm not as good as Linford Christie. He almost seemed to do it unblinking. But I am known as a bit of a starer, and I know I stare at some of you. So I'm sorry if that offends you, but I know to look at you face to face means the word will have more impact than if I just keep looking at the book. I'm looking at you. But Jesus Christ had a face like Linford Christie, or Linford Christie had a face like Jesus, let's put it the right way round, where he looked and he focused absolutely on what God wanted him to do. So there's tremendous determination in Jesus Christ to do this. He is going to the place where he knows, because he's already warned his disciples enough times, he knows what he's going to go through. And he's going to go through tremendous suffering to save us. Because you see, one of the themes Mark's got in his book is power and suffering go together. That's quite an extraordinary thing to say, isn't it? We would normally consider the people who are the most powerful in the world, and I could mention names now, but I won't, tend to have the power to reduce their own suffering. 
but the Lord Jesus Christ's power is absolutely intertwined with his suffering. And a very sensible and mature Christian once said to me, and I have to say it's largely true in my experience, God uses Christians who've known suffering. Because it breaks them of self and opens them to grace because they can't live without grace. So if you have suffered at all in your life in any way, don't sit there and think that's a terrible mistake by God. God has a plan to break you and make his grace shine through you even more by putting you sometimes through difficult things. I cannot protect any of you from a difficult situation. Life is tough at times. It's joyous. As Christians, we have joy. But there are times when there are terrible things that happen to Christians. Terrible things. I know some things that people have shared with me. They're terrible. I'm extremely upset at what happened to them. But I couldn't protect them. What I do see in many of them, almost all of them, is a heart of forgiveness and grace, which is an outstanding testimony to the love of God. And I think that's true of many of you, and I thank you for it. But power comes through suffering. Jesus Christ is standing in front of his disciples and the crowds that are following him. And this is another interesting thing I notice in this, is the distance between Jesus and the disciples and the crowd. It says here, that the crowd were afraid. Now, why are they afraid? Because there must be a sense of foreboding over them. There must be a sense in their hearts, but he's going to the place where all his enemies are. He's going to the place where the Pharisees, the legalists, hate him because of the grace that's in his message. He's going to where the Sadducees are who don't even believe in a resurrection. He's going to the place where the high priest will arrest him unfairly and imprison him. One of the most outstanding experiences I had on the one time I went to Israel was to go to the house where the high priest had lived or near it and understand where Jesus was the night they arrested him in the pit where they threw the rubbish. So they tipped out on him the absolute scum of their daily life. Isn't that a symbol of the cross? The scum of your daily life is poured out on Jesus. The scum of my filthy, stinking, rebellious, sinful life is put right onto Jesus. The scum of it is put on Jesus. Wow. The disciples are at a distance from him. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is a proper leader. He stands at the front and he takes it first. Now, you know the difference between Middle Eastern shepherds and Western shepherds, don't you? Well, if you don't, I'll tell you anyway. The difference is this. The shepherds in our country stand behind the flock and drive it. We went to Scotland once on holiday, and there was this, we saw this guy who had these sheep. He was on a golf buggy or something like it, and his dog was doing all the work, and he was sitting there driving the buggy, and the poor old sheep were out the front. That's not like the Middle East. In the Middle East, the shepherd stands at the front and he leads the sheep. He doesn't drive them. Now, you understand that in your Christian life? God does not drive you, he leads you. Listen, this is very important. The devil drives you. The devil pursues you. He crushes you. He does everything to drive you. Jesus Christ stands at the front and he leads you. In Psalm 23, leads me through the valley of the shadow of death. Many of you know that. We've known that in our family when a loved one passed away. Many of you will know that. He leads you. He does not drive you. Do not be a driven person. Please be a guided person. Listen to the Lord and let him lead you. You're not meant to drive yourself into an early grave. The Lord leads you. He stands at the front and he leads. But I notice there's a distance between the disciples at the moment and Jesus and the crowd. 
And I thought, God actually wants to live in close relationship with us. Don't fall back and stand at the back of the line. Don't be a good British person and queue up at the back. I did that when I arrived in Israel and all the people who live in that country raced out in front of me and I was the last one to go through customs because I'm a good British person and I stood at the back of the queue. You don't do that when you're a Christian. You go as close to Jesus as you possibly can. Stay close to him. March 2020, I stood here and said God had given me two things to say. Stay connected to the Lord and stay connected to each other. Now, is that true or wrong? It's true, isn't it? It doesn't make me a prophet, but I hope I am someone who listens to the Lord and delivers what he tells me to say. It's very important that you stay connected to God right now as things may start changing or as we say, possibly go back to the new normal, whatever that is. We really need each other. I think Christians need each other more than they ever have. It's very important to build fellowship around yourself. Make sure you've got Christian friends you can pray with and talk to. I don't think it's going to get easier for Christians. I think it'll get harder but it may make us deeper and stronger. That's what I think God's plan is, to make us stronger and deeper. So there's distance between Jesus and the disciples, but then there's the explanation he's going to give them. You see, Jesus Christ has told them three times, the third time's now, what's going to happen to him, but this time he gives them even more detail And he ends what he says with the hope of the resurrection, which is really important for us to grasp. So here is the detail he gives them. I will be unlawfully arrested. Jesus Christ is betrayed. A man betrays him. Look, some of you have experienced betrayal in your life. People you trusted, people you believed in, turned against you. Now Jesus understands that completely because one of his very disciples who had walked with him for three years, served with him for three years, possibly, I must have gone out in a pair and done all those amazing things that are recorded in the Gospels, Judas Iscariot. But Judas Iscariot turns against Jesus and betrays him. But Jesus' arrest is completely unlawful. The very judges that will decide his fate are the ones who arrest him. That would be like you being arrested by the magistrate and you go to court and the magistrate who arrested you is sitting in the court. It's completely wrong. But I tell you, it's going to get a lot worse than that. Listen to this about the unfair way Jesus was put on trial. I think I've got ten things that were wrong about his trial. I'll give them to you very simply. Number one, it was held at night. That's against the law. The Sanhedrin should never hold a court hearing at night. They were supposed to do it during the day. So there's number one. It's illegal on ground number one. Ground number two, it's illegal because they concluded it before sunrise. And that was against the Sanhedrin rules as well. So that makes it doubly unlawful. Here's number three. He is convicted for a death sentence on the eve of a holy day. That's against the Sanhedrin rules as well. So there's three things that are already unlawful, an unfair trial. Some of you have experienced unfairness in your life. Listen, Jesus understands that as well. Here's number four. It was concluded in only one day. That was against Sanhedrin laws as well. It should have taken longer while they took proper evidence and thought it through. Number five, the crimes that Jesus is accused of were never proven. They used a literal understanding of what he said about the temple. You kill this temple or crush this temple and I'll raise it up on the third day. He's speaking about his own body, but they thought they meant he meant the building. People can trust in religious buildings rather than in Jesus. 
I'm sorry to say this, but some of my experiences in the other denomination of which I was a local preacher, which will remain nameless, most of you know which one it is anyway. Well, they're going to close the chapel. I don't mean me, I mean the building. Whoa, this is terrible. I ain't never going to go anymore. Well, where's their faith? I'm not saying they're right to close chapels down. I'm sad. The member I drive past that I used to preach in and then some witty person will say, well, you're the one who closed them down then. No, I'm not. But I hope your faith isn't in this building. Your faith's in Jesus Christ who lives forever. Not that we disgrace this building. We inspected it two weeks ago. We've got to look after it. God gave it to us. I rather we didn't have it, but God gave it to us. It costs a lot of money, but we've got to look after it. And I'll tell you something else. Because it's been here for over 200 years, well, our first building was here 200 years ago. This one's been here since 1873. People in the town know where the Baptist church is. So if you invite people to the Bat Chap, as we used to call it, they'll know where to go because it's been here long enough. No one's around trying to close it down. The planners aren't here trying to get rid of our signs, but we fought that one successfully. They can't close it down. It's here as a witness. Yes, it'd be much easier to meet in homes and everything else, but leave that to the Lord. The Lord will know the future anyway. But we've got to look after it. But it's not, we, our faith's not in a chapel. They could close this down tomorrow and all of you could just carry on being Christians. Well, you should do. It shouldn't make that much difference. You can still meet. Even if you have to meet in secret one day, you still meet. You see, our faith is not in the building. But that's how they interpreted what Jesus said. Deliberately set up to get him killed. Because they're out to destroy him because he's destroying their wonderful religious structure that they've got the people believing in. And the people are now hearing Jesus, the true Messiah, and they heard him gladly. Only part of the Sanhedrin was there to make the vote. They should have all have been there. So it's illegal and unfair on that basis. There's no defence. Where's the defence? Except Jesus himself, no one's there to defend Jesus. So it's a completely unrighteous trial in that sense as well. Then they changed the charges. He was up for blasphemy... They turn it to treason because that means the Romans can kill him. It's an absolutely unfair trial in so many ways. It's unbelievably farcical and bad. But the enemy will use law and alter it to force people of Jesus to suffer. That's how tragic it is when you don't have justice. If you read the book of Proverbs... And you read the Psalms, you'll see how often the psalmist and the Proverbs writer long for justice. All I ask of a political leader in this country is to be honest and true. That's all I'm asking for. Where are they? Well, you can think that one through for yourself. You expect the elders of this church to be fair and just. When I was a teacher the children would have expected me to be fair and just. And if I wrongly disciplined a child, I have stood in front of a class of 30 children and I have apologised to them all. Did I lose authority because of that? No, I actually gain more. It's tremendously important that we as Christians are just and fair and honest and true. Even if it costs us, we must be truthful. This Sanhedrin trial is an absolute disgrace. It's all deliberately set up for Jesus to be sentenced and crucified. Yet, you all know, don't you, God is behind it all. God knows exactly what he's doing and his son knows what he's doing, but his son has to go through the pain of the crucifixion because even that is something that I personally find difficult to think about. Now, some of you have had the bravery to watch a film by Mel Gibson called The Passion. I can't watch it. 
I got a copy at home. I've never watched it. A person in this church kindly gave me a copy. I told him the other day, I said, I can't watch it. I cannot watch it because I can't face the pain and the suffering and the awful experience the Lord Jesus went through. I just can't hack it. I can't look at it. I'm not terribly good at looking at blood anyway. Ask my wife. I can't face it. I can't watch it. It's too terrible for me to take in. Because what he went through, and I don't like to describe it even, I think the Bible is very careful, it doesn't describe it in immense detail, the suffering and the pain that Jesus went through. And I know you shouldn't become a Christian because I've emotionally upset you with the pain of Jesus. But it's still there. It's terrible. Absolutely terrible. I mean, they spit on the Creator. They mock the Lord. In a little prayer meeting that I attend, which is mainly people from up country, a lady was describing her friends who went to a very good church in Brighton that's very effective at the moment in the will of the Lord. I've not heard of it before. The minister's called Mark Whedon, if you want to check him out on the internet. Well, these ladies went to this service, and because it was such a moving service and they felt so emboldened, they went to have a coffee after the service, and they heard four teenage lads mocking prayer. Mocking prayer. I don't know why these young men were mocking prayer, but they were. And this lady, who's quite a shy and retiring person normally, felt so constrained by the Holy Spirit that she told them off. She went to these four boys and she said, you should not be mocking God. You should not be mocking prayer. I'm telling you, it's dangerous to mock God. And they listened to her and quietened down. Now, I think that takes a lot of bravery. I must admit, if I see several young lads messing about, I tend to walk a long way away around them. I'll tell you something else. If it's teenage girls, I walk even further away from them. Because if I was to say something, I'm sure I'll get accused. But this lady spoke to them. Do you realize if God is at work, people will be afraid to mock God? Because the presence of God is so powerful, they don't do it. Do you realize now something that happened when Jesus was arrested? He spoke to them. He said, I am, and they fell back. And when he's used the phrase, I am, do you realize that's God's name, Yahweh? Are you the Messiah? Yes, I am. Which is an answer to the question, but it's much deeper than that. He's saying, yes, I am God in front of you, and they fall back. Other amazing thing Jesus did, of course, was when good old Peter, well, I shouldn't say that, strikes out with his sword and chops an ear off somebody, Jesus immediately heals it. Yet they still arrest him and they still kill him. How many more chances do you think they should be given? They still do it. So he gives the explanation. Well, now's the conclusion. I don't normally do this, but I am going to do it today. Ask you questions. Oh, we had a guy in this church who preached quite often. He used to really annoy me because he used to begin every service by interrogating us all. He'd start off by saying, why are you here? Are you here to worship? And all this is very, very annoying, you know. So I'm going to use these questions for you to think about. You may like to take an attitude of prayer as I ask you them. It's up to you. Number one, can you see the immense love of the Lord Jesus Christ to every one of you, that he would go through this to save you and to save me. Can you see it? Does your heart show any sense or recognition of that? Are you moved in your spirit, in your heart, in your will, when you consider what Jesus Christ went through for you? Here's the second question. Are you distant from God today or are you near to him? Will you get near to him, please? As I tell myself that I must stay near to the Lord Jesus Christ, not follow him from a distance, 
but follow him as close as I can. When we were young Christians, we used a book called Studies in Discipleship by the Navigators. One of the cartoons in that book said, if God seems far away, guess who moved? Here's a third question. Have you ever been to the cross? Maybe never ever in your life. But when are you going to come? Because there's no other way you could ever be saved except through the cross and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now most of you, are fall, not all of you are Christians. The cross is a place where I go to surrender again and to confess to the Lord again. And it's where I rely and I lean and I'm utterly dependent on grace given to me through his death and resurrection. So I go back there now. I go back there every time there's a communion. I sit there and pray in the spirit sometimes and that's what I did today. Because I wanted to sense, I want to be near to you, Lord. A table in the wilderness. Psalm 23 sets a table in the midst of our enemies for us. And the last one is this. Do you believe you'll rise again? You see, Jesus tells them about the resurrection. It's literal, it's bodily, and it's eternal. I've used this illustration before, but I'll use it again because someone may not have heard it anyway. When I went to see the film about the Titanic, I decided, as I'd paid to go and see it, I'd stay for all the credits. You know, and all the names come up. All that wonderful song, My Heart Will Go On, they're doing that, you know. What a great and moving song that is. And then this thought came to me from the scriptures. The sea will give up its dead. Every single person who drowned in the disaster of the Titanic, God will raise again. Some to eternal life, I think that will happen in the rapture personally, but everyone raised to either life or death. So nobody, even the non-Christians, can escape resurrection. There has to be a resurrection of everyone in the end in front of the Lord Jesus Christ just to show the power of his death in raising everyone ultimately. Now, if you're a Christian, this is a glorious truth. Glorious truth. Especially if you've lost loved ones who love the Lord. Because you know in your heart you'll see them again. Now, it's not sentimental hogwash. A nice little bright idea. Hope in the sky when we die and the way people insult that belief. It's actually literally true. And Jesus defeated death by dying and rising again. Death is defeated by his death and resurrection. And that's what he's done for all of us. Now all week, actually for two weeks, since I started talking about Abraham, this old song, and it is an old song, not too old, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And Martin kindly agreed that we could sing it. But as you sing it, will you come to him again? You may not need to because you're a very strong Christian, but most of us need times when we give ourselves afresh to the Lord. It's not that you'll be converted, it's that you realise what you're doing as a Christian. So we'll stand together and sing that and then I'll pray and then there'll be a final song. Let's stand together.
eyes closed and we're going to pray. For some of you, that's something you did a long time ago. But maybe one person here, it's the first time they've seriously considered following Jesus. I ask you to mean what you sang, that you will not turn back, however tough it gets, but you'll stand steadfast, be one of those who followed Jesus and follows Jesus, even though it might sometimes mean suffering and difficulty and pain. Lord God, have mercy upon us all. None of us stand here perfect. I certainly don't. But I thank you that you've given me perfect righteousness through Jesus. And it's a wonderful gift because I believed on him. Oh, help us, Lord, to believe on you and not turn back, but stay steadfast. Thank you, Lord Jesus for going through such awful, awful pain, legally and emotionally and physically, that I could be rescued from sin and death and hell and the enemy. How great is your love and how wonderful it is to be one of your followers. Oh, help me, Lord, not to turn back. Help me to stand firm in Jesus' name. Amen.